When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace. Yeah.
Hey, good morning. We're glad to have you in worship this morning. My name is Bobby Rich. I'm the pastor of Senior Adults First Baptist Church here in Kaufman. This is my lovely wife, Cindy. <laughs> good morning. I'm glad to have her with me this morning. Uh, listen, we're in a new series called A uh, Place to Stand. I hope you're enjoying that series. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Brent's sermon this morning. Uh, and I want to encourage you to give to the church. It's important for us. It's important for those out there that uh, this money goes to. And uh, we want to encourage you to do that either through email, through uh, dropping it off at the church. Um, or through our app online. Or, there you go. She knows all those ways. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're gl I'm glad you do because I forgot <laughs> one of them. Um, but we are glad you're here in worship this morning. We appreciate you being here. And I hope God meets you in this place. Today. We are so glad you joined us this morning. And during these unusual times, we are offering several ways for you to worship. You can worship in the parking lot, in our drive-in option. You can join us on Facebook each Sunday morning or outside in the Grove. Also, another option that we just recently started is on Wednesday nights. We are following in the Book of Acts with Pastor Brent and Bobby as they talk about the history of the church and all the history that's in Acts. So we'd love it if you could join us here in the worship venue or online at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. We are so glad that you continue to uh, join us on Facebook and in the parking lot or live. And we appreciate all your support. Thank you for joining us this morning and welcome to worship. Hey, good morning. I'm really glad you're here. Well, it was 1985 and I was new to my driver's license and new to the world. In a rare event, there had been quite a thunderstorm in the panhandle and it dropped enough rain that there were actually puddles which hung around for more than a couple of hours. I came to a low place in a road not far from my house and decided to go through it. That turned out to be a mistake. The puddle was deeper than I thought and just like that, I was stuck in the mud, which by the way is something also that happens very rarely to people in the panhandle. <laughs> About that time, a friend of mine pulled up and asked if she could help. I remember she was wearing white and I, oh so wisely, suggested that she try to give me a little push to see if we could get my car out of the mud. Right. Uh, the plan was she was going to push and I would drive. Did I mention I was 16 and new to the world? Anyway, my foolishness is not the point of this story, so please stay with me. She pushed, I pressed the accelerator, and moments later she was covered in mud and my car was still stuck. I apologized profusely. And then she took a turn at the accelerator. I couldn't get the car moving in the right direction either. We're both covered in mud. The problem was that there wasn't anywhere good to stand. The mud was everywhere. It was horribly slick. It was a lot easier to fall down than it was to stand up. And it just wasn't possible to get the footing we needed to move the car. When the Greek physicist Archimedes famously said, give me a lever and a firm place to stand and I can move the world, this is what he had in mind. No matter how good your cause or how strong your lever, you can't move anything, you can't put to, uh, to good use to that lever if you don't have the right footing, if you don't have a solid place to stand. This is an important idea right now in our world because we need to move some things. We, you and me, the Church of Jesus Christ, have some heavy lifting to do. With all the hate and anger, the depression and frustration in the world, we need to move the world toward the love and grace, the hope and compassion of Jesus. We have the greatest lever in the history of the world, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what we are suggesting today is you can't pull that lever. We can't pull that lever to move anything unless we stand on the right footing. And that right footing is the attitude of Jesus Christ. That's right. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't an effective lever to change the world unless it's accompanied by the right spirit. And that spirit is a spirit of humility. No one in all of history has moved the world further than done more to make the world a better place than Jesus Christ. What our world knows and believes about equality, justice, forgiveness, grace, sacrificial love, and compassion for others all came through Jesus. And honestly, we talk about those things a lot, but what we too rarely talk about is the footing on which he stood to pull his lever. He has transformed the world not only because he brought the right lever, but also because he brought the right footing. It is really important to consider that Jesus chose to come and live as a humble servant of God, and he chose to come as a humble servant for all of humanity. He didn't have to. Why did he do that? And what does that tell us about how we should live? We might be tempted at some level to think to ourselves, well, boy, I'm really glad Jesus did all that because I'm all about justice and equality, forgiveness and grace, love and compassion and the rest. I mean, those are my issues. That's what I'm all about. But if you are for any of those things in this world, there is only one way to bring more of them into the world, and that is the way, the humble path of Jesus. 
Right now, we have people of both political persuasions trying to bring about these things by force and power. It doesn't work. It never has. People who get pushed around don't change. They may hide their feelings, but inside they become bitter and entrenched. The place to stand if you really want to move the world isn't to stand in a place of pride or power, but instead a place to stand, the place to stand if you really want to move the world is a place of honest humility in ourselves and an unshakable confidence in our God. What Jesus modeled helps us to get the right understanding of a definition of humility. There are a few concepts in Scripture that are really more poorly understood. Humility isn't about becoming weak or small or quiet or less. Humility is about being all you can be. It's about choosing to be as powerful as possible in every way imaginable and then choosing to put all that power, all the intellectual power, the physical power, the spiritual power, the social power, whatever power you have, it's about choosing to put all that power under the authority of God while submitting all that power and capacity to the work of loving and serving others. Jesus wasn't weak in any way. Jesus wasn't small in any way. But over and over, we see that Jesus was humble. And we are called to do the same, to move through every aspect of our lives as a servant who is supremely confident in who God has made them to be in Jesus Christ. And again, let me say, Jesus is our role model, and he had no doubts about who he was and what he was capable of. And it was that very confidence that made it possible for him to choose to live a humble life. Those who don't have anything to prove don't have to go around worrying and impressing anybody. Those who find their identity in Christ don't really care what everyone else thinks about them. I've found that the most arrogant people I've ever known were deep down the most insecure. And as a result, they most often were driven by selfishness, fear, and their own self-interests. Of course, here's the thing this morning. Living a humble life is the one thing that God will not do for us. Indeed, he can't. At the very heart of faith is a moment when every one of us must choose to humble ourselves. We have to admit that we are sinners and that we are not God. We have to let go of our pride and let God's grace grab a hold of us. Paul tells us, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, the Christian faith is a faith of choice. We have a free will. We can serve ourselves and our own egos all our lives if we want. We can cling to the prideful beliefs that we are good enough for God's heaven without God's help. Indeed, we can cling to that old lie all the way to hell if we choose. But if salvation is to become ours, Jesus says we must become as a child. In other words, we must put away our pride and humble ourselves, bow our ego before the one true God, and welcome his lordship and his leadership, his forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy. And I can tell you, some people just aren't willing to take that step. They are too prideful. Across their whole lives, they never seem to find the humility to bow their knees to their creator. And so they stand there, fist to the sky, until the day they die, a meaningless death after living a cosmically worthless life. How often do we humans choose to rebel against God's leadership? How tragic the results when we do. You know, pride is the central sin of Satan, and it's the central attitude that keeps us from knowing God and his plan for our lives. And honestly, even after we first choose to humble ourselves to know God's gift of salvation and find our position in his family, we still are forever tempted to conceit and pride. Of all the virtues, this is the one that we just can't fake. So if humility is so important, if it's the holy, sure place we can find a place to stand in this world, how can we become more humble? What's the path? Well, we all feel the temptation to haughtiness and pride that so easily takes over our thoughts and attitudes. How can we be different? What's the path that leads to a deep and abiding posture and position of humility in our lives? Well, that's what I want us to look at today. Scripture tells us a lot about this. And let's start by being honest about the consequences of pride. I, I don't want to go too deep here today, but let's just take a moment to review what the Bible says about the slippery footing of pride, arrogance, and conceit. Proverbs 16, 8 says, First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Proverbs 29, 13 says, Pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. Uh, Proverbs 13, 10 says, Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice, they're wise. And in Proverbs 16, 5, Solomon wrote this, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. In self-sufficient pride, we see a path that leads to conflict, tension, resistance to change, failure after failure, judgment, and eventually destruction. There's actually a lot more of this topic on this topic in Scripture, but the big picture is that pride isn't of God, and it's never a good thing. It certainly doesn't lead us anywhere good. On the other hand, humility brings a lot of good things to people and organizations. Solomon also wrote this, 
The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's Proverbs 22. Well, so let's also remember there is a reward for choosing humility. It's interesting that Solomon leads with riches, but in 2020, there are a lot of business leaders and writers who are pointing to humility as the key to effective leadership, not just in the church, but in the boardroom and in the office. There's no doubt that it is also the path to leading an honorable and full life. When we generally think of humility as virtue, a virtue we demonstrate in relationships to other people, we get to the starting point in humbling ourselves as well. And we begin to realize that the most important starting point is humbling ourselves before God. Doing this helps us like nothing else. Humility before God was Job's way of finding peace when he faced an imaginable pain. And humility before God was the key to Zacharias finding a way out of a miserable and greedy life. Humility, humility before God, was the necessary path for the proud general Naaman to take if he was going to know God's healing in his own life. And humility before God was the first and best virtue that we find in Mary, the mother of Jesus. When the angel appears, she has the good sense to know she's not the boss of the universe, and she's glad to follow the leadership of the one who is. Of course, the very nature of humility is that we don't care about the benefits to us in choosing to live a humble life. We live that life because it's what's better for God and the people that he loves, the ones he's called us to serve. Which leads us to the biggest idea we need to grab a hold of this morning, and it's this. Let's see that humility is really grounded in love. There's this incredible connection. The reason that Jesus comes to this earth is because he loves us. And it is that love that causes him to act in humble ways. Why did God give Jesus to this world? What does John 3, 16 tell us? Because God so loved the world. From his silence before Pilate to his decision to wash the feet of Jesus and the other disciples, Jesus makes it clear that to humble ourselves before God is to choose humility as the place we stand in our relationship to other human beings that God has created. This is so important. In a world where me, myself, and I are often our three favorite people, in a world where so many people choose to self-promote, in a world where selfies are a thing, our position is that of a towel-carrying servant. Let's see that humility toward others begins with humility before God. Humility toward others takes hold when we see every other person we meet through the eyes of our Heavenly Father, humbly acknowledging the beauty of the creation that He has put before us. And how does God see every human that he has created? Well, listen, you are never going to meet another person who God doesn't love. You're never going to meet another person who God doesn't have a plan for their life. No matter what they've done or what they're like, you're never going to meet a person that is beyond God's forgiveness. And you are never going to meet a person that Jesus Christ didn't die for and that he wouldn't die for again. That, That seems to me that those people are so important, so valuable. And I know that when I struggle with humility, it's often because I have forgotten who I'm dealing with. This person, whoever it is that's in front of me in any given moment, this person is of immense value to God. And his opinion of their life is the one that should matter the most, and it should matter to me. You all watch the Pawn Stars. You know what it looks like for someone to to bring before those guys a piece of junk from their grandmother's attic in a dusty bowling ball bag or whatever, and then it find and then to come find out that the thing is actually worth five hundred thousand dollars or something. All around us, there are people who may look like and honestly act like junk, but to but the trick is having a humble heart and not allowing those appearances to fool us. Every human being has been created in the image of God. Every single one, a masterpiece shaped by God's own heart and hand. Your neighbors, your kids, your enemies. Every single person is of a measurable value and importance to God. And if we have humbled ourselves and chosen to follow him, we must, we just must follow his heart. We live in a Kleenex culture that is so very willing to throw failed people away. More and more, it's one strike and you're out in our world. But for those who wish to follow the way of Jesus, we see the incredible, unbelievable value in every person. We choose to wash the feet even of Judas. We choose to see the importance of even the most forgotten person. We choose to forgive even the most selfish and mean-spirited because we choose to see the value in them that God sees. We value them in the way that God values them. And more than that, we see and value what God intends for them to be. We understand that their future is a holy and sacred thing, even if we can't see it and nobody else does. That's where real humility begins. You want to move the world? 
or even just your family or your coworkers or your neighbor. Here's the reason that humility is the key. When we treat people like they are really valuable, sacred even, sometimes they decide to act like it. And they're more likely to listen to whatever it is God's told us to say to them. You might ask, what exactly does Christian humility look like in my world? Well, I'll tell you what, in our world, some, some, a place full of, of needs and, 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 and places where there needs to be movement, we can see the power that humility might have. Last week, Mackey spoke from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus gave the remarkable command that when some, someone compels you to walk a mile with them, you should offer to walk too. That was from, of course, his Sermon on the Mount. Well, Jesus was referring to the ancient Persian and the Greek and Roman law that allowed a soldier to force a person in an occupied nation to carry their supplies or other packages up to a thousand paces or a mile, even if it cost them great time or money. In fact, this word is only used in one other place in the New Testament, and it's used in the moment that Simon is forced to carry the cross of Jesus up Golgotha. The thing to catch here is that an enemy or someone who sees themselves as your enemy is making the demand. They're the ones that's compelling. And the response that Jesus puts forward is that we should not only carry the supplies one mile for your enemy, but you should offer to walk two. That kind of humility that sees the great value of every person around you, even your enemies, and then to see that value that God has put on them would call you to act in a way that serves them instead of despises them. I mean, that's more than a slogan you put on a t-shirt. That's the kind of humility, the kind of footing that can change the world. Now, this week, you're going to run into pretty common moments. And in those moments, you're going to have to make a decision about whether or not you will choose to be humble or prideful. A family member is going to continue to make dumb decisions, and you may feel like just letting him or her get what they deserve. But maybe the right thing for you to do is to go the extra mile with them and to be humble in spite of their mistakes. Your boss may keep adding more and more work to you, or maybe they even have a bad attitude. They deserve less than your best. But maybe you'll do the unexpected and give them more than they have asked for, and certainly more than they deserve. Uh, you know what, you, you, you're, you're, you, you may be Af- uh, Anglo and your black coworkers are just really angry and you feel all beat up because as much as you feel like you have tried to respect and treat everyone with dignity, you end up being a punching bag for every white person who's ever done anything stupid in the history of the world. And maybe in the face of that, you'll choose a position of humility and courageously go the extra mile. Or maybe it's the other way. Maybe you are, are black and you're just tired of the way that people have been treated, but you find a way to be humble in the face of it all anyway. It's not easy to be humble in the real world, but Jesus showed us that it's the way the real world gets changed. It's the way real people find the kingdom. It's the only decent place for Christians to stand who want to move the world. If we love God, we have to love those that he's created, every single one of them. And if we have found ourselves in a position where we want to follow the examples of Jesus, then humility and humbly choosing to serve the world around us. It's, it's the Jesus way. It's not just the right thing to do. It's just the smart thing to do. Right now, again, there's so much in the world that needs to be changed. And we have the lever, the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to grab a hold of that, and we want to pull and move the whole world toward the goodness and, goat and hope of God. But if we're going to do that, we've got to stand on the right footing. And the right place to stand is with an attitude of humility. The same attitude that Jesus had, uh, for sure. Would you join me in prayer? God, the world we're living in absolutely needs to move toward you. Lots of us have families that need to move to a better place. We have friendships that need to move to a better place. We have relationships in our own community that need to move to a better place. The whole culture and society needs to move. And God, we see today that your power to move the world is only accessed when we stand as Jesus did in a position of humility. God, I pray that you'd help us to do that this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. I'm really glad that you have been here today. If you're here and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, why don't you reach out uh, through Facebook or or catch us uh, in some other way online and let us know that you're thinking about these matters and you'd like to talk to someone about how to become a follower of Jesus. Jesus loves you. He thinks you're valuable. No matter what your mistakes, he wants to forgive you and put you on a path to help heal the things in this world on the way to heaven that's coming for you when this life is over. If you'd like to know more about that, I'd love to visit with you about it. You guys have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for being in worship. 
Hey, thanks for being in worship this morning. We appreciate you being here. We hope you enjoyed the worship service and God spoke to you. Uh, if you want to get connected to our church, would you just leave a comment in the comment section uh, and let us know when somebody will contact you. We'd love to hear from you uh, in that way and we'll get connected with you and so that you can end up getting connected with our church. And we appreciate you being here and being in service and you have a great week. As I journey through this land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on through him I must win. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep, then my Lord directs my bark, he doth safely keep. And he leads me gently on through this world below. He's a real friend to me, oh, I love him so. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice.